Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. For any common technical issues, please refer to the help widget located at the bottom of your screen. This webinar was pre-recorded and is being presented with a live Q&A. If you're tuning in for the initial webcast, you can submit questions via the Q&A widget on the left side of your screen. The researchers will be answering them via the widget in real time. Also, stick around after the webinar for the live Q&A when the researchers will dive deeper on popular questions asked. Additional resources and links provided from today's presentation can be found in the resource list on the right side of your screen. An on-demand version of the webinar will be available approximately one day after the initial webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. On-demand viewers will get to hear the recorded version of the live Q&A. Enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone, and welcome to this webinar on post-quantum cryptography. Today we're going to learn about super singular isogenies. I'd like to thank you for joining me, and my name is Craig Costello. I'm a senior researcher here in the security and cryptography group at Microsoft Research. Uh, and this has been my passion um, and my topic of real interest for the last, I'd say, four or five years. Uh, my background is in elliptic curve cryptography, uh, but in, in recent times, this has kind of transitioned to looking at how elliptic curves can be used to, to achieve post-quantum cryptography, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. This is a, a, a post-quantum cryptography is a, is a really hot topic at the moment and, and super singular isogenies are a way of, of achieving uh, post-quantum key exchange. It's, there's different trade-offs between uh, super singular isogenies and other methods of, uh, of achieving uh, post-quantum or, or of doing post-quantum cryptography. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, isogenies is, is the most elegant and, and by far the coolest way to do it. Today, we're going to really try to approach the topic um, from the ground up and, and really just give a high level overview of, of what's going on. There's a lot of details and a lot of jargon um, that can oftentimes be overwhelming, but we're gonna do things by really walking through step by step uh, a toy example. I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, learning things by example first and then uh, chasing the details later. And so that's what I'd like to do. Uh, I certainly wouldn't expect uh, anyone to be able to digest all of the all of the content at first sight. Um, these are these are things that took me months, if not years, to learn. Um, but the idea here is that we're going to walk through an example step by step, so that you can get the gist of what's going on. Um, and if you like, you can you can read a lot more about. Uh, the super singular isogeny Diffie Hellman um, and the the now broader field of of isogeny based cryptography. There's going to be a, a, a list of uh, supplementary materials. I believe it'll be over here on your left. Um, and in that supplementary materials will be the much more detailed uh, tutorial paper that this talk is based on. So if you want to follow along with that paper in hand, or if you want to uh, watch the talk with all of the details of this example, then that paper's where you'll find it. Um, and otherwise, there's a lot more uh, uh, detail uh, in the supplementary material there. So there's um, there's gonna be tutorial questions uh, and answers, and there's going to be a lot more further reading um, and a lot of other links to other resources that I'll talk about uh, at the end of the webinar. As I go, uh, if you're one of the people that are watching this broadcast live, I encourage you to um, ask questions. This is a pre-recording, but I'll be online when this goes live to answer any questions as we go. For those that are watching this after the fact, then some of those questions, I'll be sticking around for a live Q&A after the talk, and some of those questions will be answered uh, and recorded for you. I'm gonna walk through this exact example that we're seeing on the front slide here. So, um, this is a this is a gif that's animating essentially a, a toy example of the super singular isogeny Diffie Hellman protocol. And the way it works is uh, Alice and Bob, who are the, the two parties that want to derive a shared secret key, Alice and Bob are starting on the same node, that node that Alice just departed from now. They're starting on the same node and they're taking walks in the super singular isogeny graph. Alice is going to walk on different edges to Bob, but she's going to she's going to perform her the derivation of her public key by walking away from their same starting node. She's then going to stop at some other node in the graph and not 
reveal her walk. That's her secret. But she's going to uh, send Bob her node, which is the her public key. Bob is going to do the same thing. He's going to start at the same place that Alice did, but he's going to walk away in a, in a different graph, in, in a, the same set of nodes, but a, a different edges. And he's going to send his public key, which is the node that he lands on as a result of his secret walk. At this point, they both then do another walk from each other's uh, public keys, or, or rather from each other's uh, destination nodes of their first walk. And then using their same secret that they used to, to uh, derive their public key, they're going to land at the same shared secret. Okay, so this GIF is really animating what's going on. There's no mathematics uh, happening in this picture. But what we're going to do is actually um, dig beneath the picture and, and look at the mathematics that's going on in this toy example. This is actually a, a real example using toy parameters. Um, and then the idea is hopefully if you can understand and get the rough gist of what's going on with this toy example, extrapolating to the real world uh, parameters should be easy. Um, and we'll, we'll do that in one slide at the end of the talk. We'll talk about the difference between this toy example and uh, and what actually goes on with, with the super singular isogenies in, in practice. Before we go any further, we should really talk about why we want to do this. Why do Alice and Bob want to walk around in this funny graph? And uh, why, do, why do we want to do things this way rather than more traditional methods? And the reason is um, quantum computing. So you might have heard of quantum computing, and you might have heard that um, quantum computing can do all of these fantastic things. But one of the things that it can also do is it can also solve uh, specific mathematical problems. And it just turns out that those mathematical problems are the problems on which uh, modern public key cryptography is founded. So at the moment, we've got Alice and Bob here that want to uh, that want to derive a shared secret. And that, so Alice and Bob uh, in the real world can be anyone from, you know, Alice could be you and Bob could be your, uh, your friend over sitting on the other side of the world and you might w just want to send WhatsApp messages to each other. Or Alice and Bob could both be uh, banks and they might want to send each other, uh, you know, make a, make a transaction from the other side of the world. Uh, I guess the most common example of, of Alice and Bob that, uh, that you and I would experience every day is anytime we do a secure web browsing session and, and we use TLS to do secure web browsing, what we're actually doing is connecting to uh, a server, as assuming we're the client, and so Alice and Bob then become the, the, the client and the server, and the idea is that They've never, um, they've never come in contact before. The server doesn't, doesn't trust that the client is, saying, is who they're saying they are, and the client doesn't trust that the server is actually the, the, the server it wants to connect to. So there's got to be this, um, this exchange of data that convinces both the client and the server that they are who, who they say they are. And moreover, they've got to communicate on an insecure channel that we call the internet, and they've got to be able to, to derive uh, a shared secret or a shared common value um, that can be used then to, to be fed into traditional symmetric cryptography that can then be used to, you know, uh, either start off a, ha a, a stream cipher or a, a block cipher that can be then used to um, encrypt bulk data at a, at a much cheaper cost. So the way, that, the way that TLS or any of these protocols typically work is there's a lot of uh, mathematical operations that are done at the start in order to derive a common value or what we call the shared secret. And once you derive this shared secret, you can then proceed to do to do symmetric symmetric encryption. The problem is that quantum computers uh, threaten the public key cryptography. So they threaten the the key exchange mechanisms that are currently out there that are based on um, finite fields. So the discrete logarithm problem in a finite field, or the discrete logarithm problem on an elliptic curve. And similarly, they threaten our signature our signature scheme. So they threaten RSA based on integer factorization, uh, and they threaten the elliptic curve discrete log problem, which is also used in, in ECDSA signatures. So essentially, if and when a large scale quantum computer is built, then all of the things that Alice and Bob currently do to, to secure the internet are um, under threat. And, and if a quantum computer is built, 
uh, at a large scale, then it will break all of the all of the methods that Alice and Bob currently use, and all of the methods that we currently use um, to secure our digital our digital world. So the idea is, what we want to do today is to introduce a mechanism that does the same thing that we've always done in trying to derive a, a, a secret shared value, but we want this to be a problem that's not only hard to solve on, on the classical computers that we have today, but also on the quantum uh, computers that we're anticipating in the future. So this super singular isogeny uh, problem or this super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman that we're going to walk through is one such approach to achieving post-quantum security. So in one slide, we're going to brush over elliptic curves, which are the objects that, that are going to be the main objects that we're studying today. Um, elliptic curves have already been used in cryptography for over two decades, um, but we're going to use them in a different way than we've traditionally used them. So what is an elliptic curve? Well, an elliptic curve is a, a cubic curve that we usually write E over K, and you, you often see what we call the short Weierstrass equation. So it's Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B. We're going to use a slightly different equation today, but where do elliptic curves come from? Well, elliptic curves are essentially the first, or rather the simplest geometric object that offers um, security different to, say, the security of uh, the finite field discrete log problem. So elliptic curves are a group, um, and we've used these groups to replace other groups in cryptography like finite fields um, or even RSA in the case of signatures. We've used elliptic curves because they, they offer uh, more strength as far as their, the best known attacks against the discrete log problem. So in old school ECC, uh, what, we, what we often do is we write this elliptic curve over a finite field FQ, and we fix this curve once and for all, meaning we, we find a, a, a well-chosen curve that, that has a, a prime or near prime number of points, and we work in this large prime order subgroup where hopefully the discrete logarithm problem is, is hard. Now, our group elements on these curves are, are the set of points, the set of points that satisfy this curve. So the, these curves are in two variables, X and Y. We look at all of the solutions to this uh, equation over the finite field, and together with this um, fabricated point or this uh, additional point, which we call the point at infinity. This acts as the identity of the group. So our group is the set of all the solutions to the equation and this additional identity element that we write uh, mathcal O of E. Um, and so what is the fundamental operation that we're, that we're dealing with? The fundamental operation is encoding our secrets by taking a point on that elliptic curve and performing the group operation and or adding the adding the point to itself n times. And we do that via um, the scalar multiplication. So on the right, you can see that we've got these elliptic curves that are these geometric things that we can write down. And whether we're in the bottom, in the picture on the bottom right, we're adding the point P to itself. And in the picture in the top right, we're adding two different points, P and Q on this elliptic curve. And we do that by running a line through the through the two points, finding the third intersection of that of that line with the cubic curve, because a line and a, a linear function and a cubic function must intersect in three places. And then we we negate the, the result or we, we flip the point over the x-axis to get the sum of the two points. So that's how the elliptic curve group law looks. And we're going to use those two um, those two pictures or the or the math that's happening underneath those two pictures to compute scalar multiples of a point quickly. So just like in a finite field or in uh, working modulo a prime, we might, uh, we might square and multiply to do uh, group exponentiations very quickly. On an elliptic curve, we, we say we double and add, um, which, is the, which is the analog of, of uh, square and multiply in a finite field. Now the discrete logarithm problem, which all of the uh, classical elliptic curve cryptography is built upon, is if I input the point S, uh, which is p added to itself n times, or this, the scalar n, the the nth scalar multiple of p. If I input s and p, the question is, what was the scalar n? And that that's the elliptic curve discrete log problem, and we believe it's very hard. That's why currently the internet is secured using this problem. Uh, but that is that is the f foundational problem of of classical elliptic curve cryptography. It's also the problem that uh, quantum computers are very good at solving. So if a large scale computers, uh, quantum computers built, then this problem becomes easy. But for now, 
uh, it's exponentially difficult and uh, we hope um, we hope well we, we have been hoping that it's it's secure against uh, classical attacks one thing I will say is that elliptic curves are both uh, you, could, you should think of them as both being algebraic and geometric objects so they're geometric in the sense that we can draw those pictures on the right they're they're curves we can um, we can write down, uh, you know, we can write down stuff about their geometry, but they're also algebraic in the sense that we can, we can, um, we can do uh, group operations on them, and we can, I guess, from a cryptographer's standpoint, we can forget about the the geometry and um, work with the points algebraically. So there's kind of two or three more concepts we have to um, introduce before we start looking at the SIDH protocol. The first thing we need to look at is isomorphisms and Jane variants. So we might have two elliptic curves that look different, but they could essentially be the same thing or they could be roughly, one could be the same as the other thing, but it's just in disguise. And that's what we, we call isomorphic. So if they have this same Jane variant, then we say two elliptic curves are isomorphic and this is an if and only if. So if we're looking at this elliptic curve E sub, of a, e sub a, which is a Montgomery curve, y squared is x cubed plus ax squared plus x, it has a J invariant that's given by that function of A. And so we might have two elliptic curves like we have in this example that have different A values. But because they both have the same J invariant, so one has A equal to 208 I plus 161. Here we're working in a quadratic extension field of, of F sub 431 or the finite field of size 431. If these two elliptic curves have the same J invariant, which they do, then we know that they're isomorphic. And what that means is we can write a simple uh, linear map between all of the points on that curve. So uh, this, this, map psi that's, uh, this map psi that's written from E to E prime, it takes the X and Y coordinates of any point on E, any rational point on E, it multiplies the x coordinate by uh, some constant value, 66i plus 182. It then adds another value and it multiplies the y coordinate by some value. And magically, you get a point on the new curve, E prime. And that will work for every single point in the, uh, the, the group of points on E. Conversely, there's psi inverse, which will map every single rational point from the group of points on E prime to a rational point on the group of points of E. So because there's no exceptions, roughly speaking, we can, we can look at these maps and say there will be no exceptions to these maps, provided we, we define um, the maps at the points at infinity, which I've, I've done on the last line. But because there's no denominators here, we don't expect there to be any exceptions to those maps. And, and indeed, that goes hand in hand with them being an isomorphism. They don't really have a kernel beyond the points at infinity themselves. So we say that they've got a trivial kernel, and that they are isomorphisms. So basically, we in, in SIDH, in the, in the supersignal isogeny protocol, we treat these curves as being the same or belonging to the same isomorphism class. Now, this is a good way to start thinking about isogenies is, is being more general maps than, than isomorphisms. In fact, isomorphisms are, in fact, a special case of isogenies. So with an isogeny, they are, again, maps between elliptic curves but they're maps that have exceptions. So I've written an example of an isogeny here, uh, which is this, this map phi that takes points from E sub A to points on E sub A prime. But notice now that, these, that this map has denominators. So it takes almost all of the X values on uh, E sub A to a point on E sub A prime, but there's an x value that will make those denominators be zero, which will uh, make that map as it's written ill-defined. And in fact, this is the point with x coordinate 350i plus 68. That point, uh, the y coordinate of that point is zero. Um, that corresponds to it being a point of order two. So that, but that point is an exception um, to that to that rational map as it's written, and it is in fact in the kernel of this isogeny. So not only does the kernel contain the point at infinity, it also contains a rational point, in this case a point of order two, that will, that will uh, make those denominators vanish. And that's why 
we've got this more general def definition of an isogeny. So if there is um, elements in the kernel beyond the point at infinity, then we're not we're no longer dealing with two objects that are each other in disguise. We're dealing with elliptic curves that are isogenous. And in this case, you can see that they've got two different J invariants. Um, so they're not isomorphic, but they they are isogenous. So isogenous is this more general uh, more general way of mapping points on elliptic curves. And what we're really interested in is um, compute the, computing these sorts of rational functions. Uh, to, the, the, the sorts of computations we do in SIDH, they take the, the X and Y coordinates of a point on E sub A, and they do these rational functions, like the one that's written there, and they output the, the coordinates of a point on E sub A prime. You might think, oh, how big can these rational functions be? Well, it closely depends on, on the number of points that we want in the kernel of the isogeny. The first point to really note here, and it's a, and it's a, a rather important one, is that um, the, the types of isogenies that we're going to be dealing with, which are what we call separable isogenies, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with kernels. Um, and in particular, these kernels have to be subgroups of the, of the set of points on the elliptic curve E. So for any subgroup of points on the curve E, there is a unique isogeny such that that subgroup is the kernel. And conversely, for any given isogeny, there is a unique set of points um, in the domain that, that forms the kernel of that isogeny. Uh, and, and it will be a subgroup of points on, on E. So the way that we make this explicit, and in, indeed the way that that map um, that, that rational map was derived is with what's what what's called Valu's formulas. So uh, in Valu's formulas, you can input the the elliptic curve E and any subgroup of points of the of the points on E, and Valu's formulas will magically output the codomain curve or the the image curve E prime and the map phi that is needed to move points through the isogeny. Now, Valu's formulas, the, the formulas given on this page are rather, rather simple. That's because there's only two elements in the kernel. There's the point of infinity and there's this point of order two. So there's, this is a subgroup of order two, which is why the degree of, um, the degree of these rational maps is, is two. And in general, the degree of these separable isogenies is the number of elements that you specify in the kernel. So if we had uh, a subgroup with uh, a subgroup with 100 elements, the, the, the maps here would be of degree 100 and, and so on. Um, and so what you need to take forward is that the, the, the formulas are, um, to compute them and to evaluate them, uh, the, it takes time roughly proportional to the size of the, the subgroup that we're dealing with. Um, another fact that's really, really useful in SIDH is that if you've got an isogeny from the elliptic curve E1 to the uh, curve E2, and another one from E2 to E3, then these can be composed to give an isogeny from E1 to E3. Uh, but in that case, the degree of the composition is the product of the degrees. And this is something that we, that we really need going forward because it, uh, it allows us to compute what look like very large degree isogenies um, as, a, as a chain or as a composition of, of many small isogenies. And again, it should be noted that isogenies are both algebraic and geometric morphisms. So just like the elliptic curves are algebraic and geometric, we can draw pictures of points on curves and we can treat them algebraically as groups. The, uh, the maps themselves are also algebraic and geometric. So we can, they map points from one curve to points on another curve in the geometric sense, but also they map, they preserve the group law on the first curve um, to the group law on the second. So that last equation on this slide says that phi of p plus q is 5p plus 5q. The plus on the left-hand side is the group law on E, and the plus on the right-hand side is the group law on E prime. The isogeny respects this group law, and from this you can derive a lot, lots of facts that, uh, that become uh, uh, useful to take with us in, in SIDH. So we'll be keeping it simple today. We'll be mainly dropping the y coordinate. So this slide is saying whether we're dealing with the multiplication by n map, which takes points on the curve E and maps them to points on the curve E. So it's it's technically an isogeny, but it's not a, a really interesting one as far as we're concerned because it keeps us on the same curve. It's a special case where the image curve turns out to be the curve itself. Uh, 
or we're dealing with non-trivial isogenies, isogenies that move us from one curve to another. The way that maps are always written, uh, the x moves to some rational function of, of x on the new curve, and the y coordinate is just multiplies by the derivative of that function of x and some constant. So for the purposes of, of, of this uh, webinar, we're going to ignore the y-coordinate and just work with, with x-coordinates and, and just look at the uh, x-coordinate formulas explicitly. Um, and happily, this is also what's done in practice. So whether you're talking about um, ECC in the classical sense or you're talking about post-quantum ECC with isogenies, um, this dropping of the y-coordinate and just looking at x-coordinates is what we do in practice. So it's what I, the actual implementations um, do to save, to save, to, to be faster and simpler. Um, and the other really nice thing going forward, going forward is that we only need isogenies of degree two and three. So uh, you saw on the last slide that the, the complexity of a prime degree isogeny is proportional to the, to the degree itself, um, the time complexity. And so that's why we're going to just take the two smallest primes. We're going to let Alice do deal with two isogenies and we're going to let Bob deal with three isogenies. And roughly speaking, this is the only functions that Alice and Bob need to do an SIDH, or at least to compute an isogeny in the SIDH landscape. So on Alice's side, the only sorts of functions she needs is the multiplication by two map, which takes points on a given curve and just doubles them or computes you know, the image of the multiplication by two map. And she needs two isogenies. So she needs isogenies like the one we saw before, whose kernel is of size two. So it's the point at infinity and, and one other element. In this case, it's the, the element alpha comma zero, a point of order two on, on E sub A. Uh, and she also needs to be able to update the coordinate of the, the curve she's working on. This, she, she moves from EA to EA prime, and she needs to be able to update accordingly. On Bob's side, he needs the multiplication by three map, which is this uh, degree nine map that you see in, in blue. And he needs to be able to compute three isogenies. So he needs to be able to come across a subgroup of, of order three and input that subgroup into Velu's formulas. The output of that is exactly like you see as this second equation in the blue box. He also needs to be able to update his, from the curve that he was sitting on to the new curve that he walks to, the, the curve coefficient, which is, uh, which is this A prime. Okay, so that, that's essentially all of the operations that you need to do to do SIDH in the real world. Okay, so here goes. We're going to focus on a toy example, but really the only difference between the toy example that we're working with and the examples that we use in the real world is the size of the primes that we deal with. So here uh, we're going to take the, the nice tiny prime P equals 431, um, but in general these, the primes will be exponentially large, so they'll be anywhere between uh, 400 bits and, and 800 bits are, are the types of primes we use in practice. We always work over the quadratic extension field um, for technical reasons that you can you can look up in in the tutorial. But essentially, all of the J invariants, so those isomorphism invariants that correspond to super singular elliptic curves, all of those Js are always defined over FP squared. We never have to extend our prime fields any higher to to go looking for um, J invariants that that uh, correspond to super singular elliptic curves. And uh, there's a theorem that says that uh, no matter what prime we're dealing with, there's always very close to P over 12 or the floor of P over 12 super singular J invariants. And they become the nodes in the graph, the nodes in the super singular isogeny graph that we're, that we're working with. So in this case, P is 431 and, and the floor of P over 12 is, I believe, 37 or it, it, it'll be either 35 36 or 37 and we're always within we're always within two of the number of nodes uh, the, sorry p over 12 the floor of p over 12 is always within two of the number of nodes that are in the super singular isogeny graph so in this case there's 37 nodes in the graph and they are all of the super singular j invariants over this over this prime but for any prime you you write down you'll always have roughly P over 12 such nodes. And they, these become the elements that we work with in, in SIDH. For Alice and Bob, the, the nodes are the same. So the nodes are always this fixed set, but the edges between those nodes are different. And importantly, they're, um, they should be very unrelated or Alice's nodes shouldn't really 
be related in any way that's meaningful to, to the way that Bob's nodes um, look. So Alice works in what we call the two isogeny graph. Now, that means that at each node, with the, with the exception of a, uh, of a handful of the nodes here, there's three edges emanating from any given node. And they correspond to the, to the three possible two isogenies that we saw a couple of slides ago. So if you look at any node in this graph, there should be three edges connecting you to some other um, node in the graph. And the reason we, the, the, the reason we believe that uh, super singular isogeny graphs are a good place to do crypto, and not only crypto, but post-quantum crypto, is that um, they're what we call expander graphs, and they, they've got a lot of uh, really nice properties, uh, uh, security properties, um, that you, you, can, you can look up in the tutorial sheet for the, uh, to, for, for the, um, the mathematical definitions. But roughly speaking, what it means is that there's no way to draw these graphs um, such that the, the, the edges would, be, would look any less messy. Um, what it means is we can essentially get from any node in the graph to any other node in the graph with a, uh, a relatively small number of steps. So there'd be no way to rearrange these nodes such that Alice's edges look um, any less messy than they currently do. Any, any reordering of these, it should look that messy. But what that means is that you can, with a small number of steps from any given node, you should, uh, you should be able to be distributed randomly across the whole graph. Um, so this is what this rapid mixing property guarantees. It means that we can, we can, uh, be, com be confident that as long as we take a certain number of steps from a given node in the graph, then uh, we could essentially land anywhere with, with reasonably uniform probability. Bob's graph, again, as I said, it uses the, exactly the same nodes, but his graph has different edges. He's going to walk with three isogenies. And so at any, at any given elliptic curve or uh, isomorphism class or at any given Jane variant, Bob now has four subgroups of order three that determines his three isogenies. And what that means is there's four edges emanating from any given node um, in this graph. So Bob's graph looks a lot messier, but again, there should be no way to really draw these nodes such that these edges look any less messy. Any way we, we reorder these things, um, it's going to be equally as messy. But again, these, these graphs are all connected, which means you can get from any given node to any other given node. And as long as we take relatively small number of steps, we, we should get a uniform distribution in our walks across, across the graph. And that's why we believe that these expanded graphs are, offer good security in, in cryptography. One more slide before we, before we enter the protocol is in, in coming up with a toy example that's, that's actually real, that actually corresponds to, I guess, a toy, toy version of the protocol. Um, there's some things that look, there's, there's some behaviors that look like they might, they might be problematic for larger parameters, but as the parameters scale, these behaviors go away. And one of them is that in this example, um, a lot of the nodes look like they correspond to Jane variants that are defined over FP rather than FP squared. So they're the ones that, that don't have any uh, extension, that, that then they've just got base field elements as their Jane variants. Um, but what happens is as P gets large, as P approaches infinity or, or approaches parameters of cryptographic size, uh, these become really, really rare in the graph. So as we said, there's roughly P over 12 of these nodes, but as P becomes huge, only square root of P or big O of the square root of P of these uh, are in the base field. So here it looks like more of them are in the base field than, than ones that are in the extension field, but this is just an artifact of it being a small example. And of course, I wanted to choose an example that fits on one slide. I didn't want to have to draw all these nodes and edges for a much larger example. So uh, but you should rest assured that these, these red dots become uh, exponentially unlikely in, in graphs of cryptographic size. The other thing is there's some, there's some nodes for which there's self edges or where there won't be um, the same number of, or the, the, the usual number of edges from a given node to another node. But again, these, these stay as um, a small finite number. So as P goes up to cryptographic size, these, these behaviors go away um, and, and went, we're not to be worried about these. One more comment that's worth, uh, one more thing that's worth commenting on is that this, this super singular isogeny graph uh, behaves in the same way it did for, for two and three, as, it do, as it'll behave the same way for any given prime. 
So Alice and Bob could use L equals five or L equals seven or any other prime degree to do their isogeny walks. Um, but in this case, we choose the we choose two and three because those isogenies are the most efficient, relatively speaking. And we therefore choose our primes so that these isogenies uh, are what we say uh, are rational in the field. So when we do the computations, the the subgroups that we come across have elements that are defined over over uh, the, the group of rational points over FP squared. And therefore, because our subgroups are defined over FP squared, the inputs to Valu's formulas are also defined over FP squared, and therefore the outputs of those formulas or, or, or all of the computation in those formulas will be over FP squared. So we could work with five or seven even over this prime, but to do so we'd have to find um, torsion points that are that are defined over higher higher fields than FP squared, um, which would make the computations a lot slower. So that's why we deal with two and three and 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 not with five or seven or any other prime. But it's worth noting that these that the graphs still exist for, for any prime. Okay, so now we're going to go step by step through the protocol. We're going to we're going to uncover what was going on with the with the picture on the first slide or with the GIF on the first slide. So what happens in the protocol is Alice and Bob both start on a on a public node. So these parameters in light blue here, they're all public for the for the whole world to see. So they they're set up once and for all at um at setup and everybody who uh, participates in the protocol will will essentially start from the same node and that's where Alice and Bob start. So we're going to start at this node 87i plus 190 and uh, we're going to on Alice's side she's going to walk on those edges in the two isogeny graph and on Bob's side he's going to walk on the edges in the three isogeny graph. What they also need is um, is points that they can use to find subgroups of a given order. So our prime here, as you saw on the previous slide, was 2 to the 4 times 3 to the 3 minus 1, that 431. What that means is Alice is going to compute 2 to the 4 isogenies, or 16 isogenies, but she's going to compute them as 4 chained 2 isogenies. Rather than just one, one big 16 isogeny, she's going to do it most efficiently as a sequence of 4 2 isogenies. On Bob's side, he's going to compute three three isogenies. We like to we like to um, choose our parameters such that two such that Alice's um, Alice's two to the four is roughly the same size as Bob's three to the three. And to 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 compute two to the four isogenies, what we need is um, kernel elements that are of order sixteen. So Alice is given two points uh, P A and Q A in blue in the blue box. That are both of order 16 on this starting curve. Bob's given two points of order 27 on the starting curve, and he uses these uh, these basis points to input a secret integer. And as an output of that, uh, uh, as an output, he he gets a secret kernel point of the order of the isogeny that he's going to compute. So this is how it works for Alice. She takes those two points P A and Q A in the blue box. And she chooses a secret integer ka somewhere between 0 and 16, or 0 and 15. And that defines uh, her whole secret isogeny. So in this case, we're going to assume that Alice chooses the, the secret 11 as her secret integer. Uh, and, and she's going to input that to compute this secret point s sub k. So her secret point is 271i plus 79. That's the x-coordinate the one highlighted in red, and that defines her destination node. But to get there, she's going to compute that 16 isogeny as a composition of four two isogenies. In Bob's case, his secret's going to be the integer two, somewhere between zero and 26. That defines his, his destination node, but he's going to get there as a sequence of three three isogenies. So let's walk through Alice's case. We're going to use those explicit formulas that we saw um, at the start. And Alice is going to start here with her, with her secret point S of, of order 16. She's going to compute the eight times that point S as a sequence of those 
doubling. So she's going to compute three point doublings to get a point uh, of order two. And that defines the kernel of her first two isogeny, which in putting that into Valu's formulas takes her to the curve with J invariant 107. So there she's computed phi sub zero, which is the first two isogeny in her walk. She also uses those formulas we looked at earlier to move the point S through that two isogeny so that, that that point can be moved through the two isogeny and it becomes a point of order eight on the new curve with J invariant 107. She's then going to multiply that point by four to get another point of order two, but on the new curve. And inputting that point of order two into Valu's formulas on the curve with J invariant 107 gives her a new isogeny phi sub one. That isogeny then takes her to the curve with J invariant 344i plus 190. She also moves the point phi naught of s through phi one. And again, its order decreases by a factor of two. So it's now got order four on that point, which means Alice only needs to double it once more to get a point of order two on this curve. And she uses that point of order two, inputs it into Valu's formulas to get the isogeny phi sub two. She then moves to the, the curve that she's on now and, and moves her secret point through phi sub two. And its order again decreases by two. And now she's got uh, a point of order two already, which determines her final isogeny phi sub three. So Alice has computed these four two isogenies, and now she's landed on uh, the curve with J invariant 222i plus 118. And that is going to be Alice's public key. So she's going to keep those steps secret and, imp uh, and, and output just the J invariant of the, the curve she landed on. Now, uh, so this is, this is a summary of what she's done. She's used a secret integer somewhere in her, um, in her key space from 0 to 15, and that defined a sequence of steps that she took in the two isogeny graph, and, and uh, she outputted this, this uh, J invariant here. On Bob's side, he's going to do the same thing, but, but in the three isogeny graph. So he's going to start with his point of order 27, He's going to use triplings to multiply it down to be a point of order three. That defines his first three isogeny, which moves him one node. He's then going to move that point, uh, that original point of order 27 through his first uh, three isogeny phi sub naught. It's then going to be a point of order nine on this second curve. He only needs to triple that once, and that gives him the kernel of his second isogeny uh, phi sub one. Once he's on this second, this second image curve, he, and he's moved that point of order uh, nine through his second three isogeny, he's now got a point of order three on, uh, on this curve. That defines his final three isogeny phi sub two, which takes him to his public key, which will be this, this J invariant 344i plus 190. So Alice and Bob have both completed the first parts of their walk. And Bob's, uh, Bob's uh, public key generation is summarized the same way. And now what they need to do is send each other their, um, their public keys. So that's, that's what we would do, uh, I guess, in, the, in the, uh, the first stage of transactions in TLS or in any other protocol. We'll, they'll, they'll do their, uh, private, their, their public key generation in private and then send the public keys over this channel and... Alice and Bob will um, also take each other's uh, generator points and have moved those through their isogenies at the same time. Now, this is a technicality that I won't get into, but um, you can check the details in the paper and in a later slide uh, for why they have to do this. But they not only have to have to send their image curves, but they have to send the images of their um, of each other's generator points uh, moved through these isogenies. Okay, so now once Alice and Bob exchange their public keys, Alice then starts a new walk from where Bob ended up. So Bob sent Alice that, uh, that J invariant 344i plus 190, and that's where Alice will start with her second walk. She uses the image points that Bob sent as well, but 
and and the same original secret integer to compute a kernel of a new 16 isogeny. Now I'm not going to walk through the the steps uh, again this time because it's exactly the same as as during public key generation, but Alice will again compute four two isogenies exactly the same way as she did before to end up on a destination node. In this case, it's the, the node with J invariant 234. Bob's going to do the same thing. He's going to start where Alice finished, start at Alice's public curve. He's going to compute the, his, his secret kernel the same way and then take three steps to land at the same curve. Now, as an exercise for later, um, and I've started it off here on, on the slide, but a good exercise to do is to convince yourself that, um, and to do this, you have to use the properties of, of, of isogenies or of this um, being a group homomorphism, that Alice and Bob will land on the same node in this graph. And so now they've done those walks, they've landed on the same node, and they've used this, this SIDH protocol to come up with the same secret J value. And notice that the, all the information the attacker has is the, the curve that they both started on, the two curves that they sent over the wire, which we can, they're, they're public keys, which we can assume the attacker has as well. And the attacker's then tasked with the, with the problem of trying to figure out where they both walked to. And the assumption is that this is indeed um, secure or hard for the attacker to do. Okay, so now that we've seen how the protocol behaves over a toy example, it's time to have a look at what changes between that toy example and an example of, of how SIDH or psych is used in the real world. Mathematically, there's not too many, there's not too many differences uh, between the way that the, the, the uh, protocol works. In our toy example, we saw that Alice took four two isogenies and Bob took three, three isogenies. Now we want the number of the isogenies that they can, the, the number of possible 16 and 27 isogenies that they can take to be a lot larger than that so that we, we, have, uh, we have a secure key space and, and so many uh, possible random walks um, that an attacker can't, can't brute force them all. So we, we need to bump the parameters up, uh, but essentially as far as the functionality goes, that's the really the only difference in between the toy example that we've seen in the webinar and between the examples that are used in the real world. Now, when I say the real world, I'm referring to four sets of uh, parameters that have been put forward by uh, uh, myself and some researchers here, uh, Michael Narig and, and Patrick Longer, and a big team of uh, fellow isogenists from around the world that have submitted the SIDH uh, or psych protocol to the US's uh, NIST or National Institute of Standards and Technology, they're currently considering um, a, a number of post-quantum cryptographic uh, proposals for standardization. And the, Psyche is the, the one that's based on isogenies or based on the protocol that you've, you've just seen. And, and really the only difference between, uh, important I guess mathematical difference between the toy example that we've just walked through and the examples we use in practice is the number of isogenies that Alice and Bob take and the sizes of the primes that we that we therefore have to use. So the smallest parameter set that we've uh, put forward is when Alice takes a isogeny of size two to the 216. So she's taking 216 two isogenies and Bob's taking 137 three isogenies. In a graph that corresponds to a 434 bit prime. So in that in that, uh, uh, with a prime of size 400, uh, of roughly size two to the 434, then the number of nodes in that graph is roughly p over 12, or let's say two to the uh, 430, roughly speaking. So we've got a huge exponential number of nodes, and we're working in this expander graph. And Alice is taking 216 um, two isogenies. Bob is taking 137 three isogenies. But essentially nothing changes with, with the explicit formulas that we saw and the, and the way that the uh, protocol functions and what we're doing uh, in practice. The only difference between uh, the raw protocol that you saw today or SIDH um, and the protocol that's proposed in the, in the psych specification 
is that we have to do one more step or, or a couple more additions to make sure that the protocol is secure against active adversaries. We want the protocol to be secure in the real world where adversaries can't tamper with Alice and Bob's public keys or they can't use malicious public keys that they've generated to learn secret information about Alice and Bob's secret isogenies without actually attacking the hard mathematical problem. We want these, uh, we want these protocols to be as secure as the, the mathematical problem on which they're based. So in our case, we had to transform um, using some other cryptographic techniques, some well-known and, and standard techniques to transform this uh, passively secure protocol that we saw today into an actively secure uh, key encapsulation mechanism. But um, for all of those details and, and for much more, I encourage you to, to check out the, uh, the web page uh, from our psych team at, at psych.org or to play with the software and to actually check out the, the post-quantum uh, uh, a number of post-quantum proposals uh, made here and elsewhere. You can go to the NIST website and check out the, uh, the 26 candidates that are still in the running um, for post-quantum standardization uh, at the link there, down there at the bottom. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and for, and for coming to this webinar. And I'll uh, now be sticking around to answer some of the questions that were posed during the webinar. Um, and if you're not in the live broadcast today, but you're looking at this uh, later on, or if your uh, questions don't get answered now, uh, please feel free to, to send questions to my, uh, to my email at craigco at microsoft.com. Um, I'm always happy to, to, to talk isogenies with uh, budding and maybe future isogenists. Thanks. Hello everyone. Thanks very much for attending the webinar on super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman and this live Q&A. My name's Craig Costello and I'm here with my colleague Michael Narig. So over the next uh, 15 minutes, we're going to be answering some of the top questions that have been submitted by the audience. Um, apologies if we don't get to all of them. Uh, we've just been selecting them as we go. Some of, some of them we've been answering uh, live during the talk and some of them uh, we've been answering privately, but uh, we've chosen some that are that are really good. That we're going to um, we're going to start answering uh, now. So let's get started. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael. So I'm going to read the first question. Um, so the question is as follows: Are there papers which prove that encryptions based on isogenies are indeed quantum resistant? I know this is currently not the case for lattice-based encryption methods. Yeah, so that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, of course, we would love to have a, an ironclad mathematical proof that uh, any given scheme is uh, resistant to quantum attacks. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's not the case for isogenies and it's not the case for any of the um, any of the supposed post-quantum proposals. But interestingly, it's also not the case for any of the uh, classical schemes that we already use, like RSA or um, uh, elliptic curve cryptography based on the discrete log problem. There is no proof that any of these schemes are even secure against uh, classical attacks. So really what we do in cryptography, if in the absence of being able to to to, uh, to find such a proof, we look for problems that stand the test of time. So we look for problems that we believe are hard, and then we study them for uh, years and decades. And then once hopefully little or no progress has been made trying to attack these problems, um, we start to get confidence that they are secure. There, yeah, there there is no um, proof that any of the any of the schemes that we already use are even secure against classical computers and all of these uh, quantum supposed post quantum uh, cryptography schemes there we don't even have proof that uh, an ironclad mathematical proof that these that these proposals are secure against classical attacks 
let alone against quantum attacks. So it could be that someone um, takes any of the quantum proposals, lattices, isogenies, codes, and goes home and attacks them um, using some new algorithm on a classical computer, you know, overnight. And then that would really shake up the field. Uh, but our many, many decades of, of research into uh, a lot of these problems give us confidence that those that there are no classical attacks. Now, the difference between the uh, the supposed post-quantum secure encryption and, and signature schemes that we're looking at and the classical schemes like RSA and, and finite fields uh, and uh, elliptic curves is the only thing we, we do know is that there is a quantum attack that breaks those schemes. So um, we, we do know with certainty that if a large scale quantum computer is built, it will be able to run Shor's algorithm and either factorize large integers or uh, solve the discrete log problem um, in, in uh, polynomial time or um, polylogarithmic time. And so what we do know for sure is that, that there is a quantum attack against the schemes like RSA and, and classical elliptic curve cryptography, which is why we've been forced to look for other problems that we believe are classically hard, just like those other ones, but for which we don't know of a quantum attack, even if a large scale quantum computer is built. So it just so happens that all of the schemes that we, that we currently use to secure the internet, um, we do know that there's a quantum algorithm um, that already exists. And if a quantum computer can run that algorithm, those schemes will be broken. But uh, the, the, the schemes that we're currently looking at for, for post-quantum security, um, no, there's no proof, but we do believe that they are both classically and, and uh, quantumly hard. So I hope that, that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, maybe we should pass so, to the next question. Uh, yep, let's go to the next one. So uh, the next question we picked is the following. We've talked, uh, well, we've talked about, uh, we've answered a few questions about the numbers of qubits or the size of quantum computers that are needed to break actual crypto systems that are used right now. So this question is related to that. Um, how many years are we away from a quantum computer that will be able to have 4,000 plus qubits? Is it roughly 10, 20 years away? Well, I'm going to answer this. <laughs> this is a very good question. And we all would like to know. So uh, some people that are rather uh, sarcastic say, oh, it's always 20 years away. Um, sort of, yeah, playing to the, the fact that people have tried for several decades now. And it doesn't seem to be a lot of progress there, although there is. But I would say we, we actually don't really know. Um, some people who are very optimistic and are working in, in the field trying to build uh, hardware that can produce qubits say if all goes well, it could be in sort of seven years, could be in 10 years. I suppose the problem now is a lot of hard engineering questions that need to be answered uh, and um, the real question is how, how do these qubits scale up? So you might have heard that there are quantum computers with tens of qubits, uh, 50, 70 qubits. But the question is, can we really scale this up to thousands? And note that the ones that are <clears throat> out there right now are numbers you read in the, in the news. They are usually um, physical qubits. So for, for doing these algorithms, uh, we would have to get to logical qubits, which might mean any uh, logical qubit might need up to thousands of logical qubits to be stable uh, long enough. Um, so yeah, sorry, I guess we can't really answer this question. <clears throat> All right, um, so let's go to the next one. Um, question is, how can we be sure that security is not affected by giving auxiliary points PA, PB, QA, and QB to the system? You want to answer that, Craig? Hello? 
Yes, Michael, thank you. That's, oh, a, that's a fantastic <laughs> question. Uh, those auxiliary points, okay, so first of all, in, I guess in, in relation to what I was saying before, um, we'd, we'd always like to be sure that security is not affected by anything we do. Um, but in this particular case, we're not sure um, whether or not the inclusion, including these auxiliary points uh, affects this, the security or, or, or the difficulty of the underlying hard problem. At the moment, the assumption is um, the the assumption is that the isogeny problem, using the parameters that we use, for example, in Psych, using those parameters and including the auxiliary points, uh, the the assumption is that the attacker uh, finds the problem no easier using these auxiliary points than if these auxiliary points weren't given. So that's just in relation to the difficulty of the underlying misogyny problem itself. Uh, we, we believe at the moment that um, with parameters that are balanced and parameters that are chosen like the ones in the psych specification, that these auxiliary points give the attacker no, uh, no more advantage than if the attacker didn't have them at all. But uh, there has been work um, in multiple directions that shows that these, are point, the, these auxiliary points can be problematic. Um, the first, which is um, really interesting, is that these auxiliary points were used to give uh, an active attack against um, the original SIDH protocol in the case that uh, one, or, one or both of the parties wants to reuse uh, their private key. So they want to maybe um, have a long-term uh, static public key. Then it was shown that um, a, 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 an active attack that uh, messes around with the auxiliary points um, can, can be used to gain information uh, using a very small number of protocol interactions with the party holding the, the long-term static key. Um, and in a, in a very small number of uh, interactions, the, the party that's tampering with these auxiliary points can uh, recover the full private uh, long-term static key. And so this is the reason that the SRDH protocol, uh, the, the, the simple one and the one that you saw in the webinar, this is the reason that the SRDH protocol had to be modified from SRDH, which is super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman, into psych, which is super singular isogeny key encapsulation. So, we, what has to be done is um, these public, uh, sorry, these auxiliary points that are uh, part of the public key, there's a check that's done in psych that's not done in SIDH um, that requires a little more work, but there's a check that's done to make sure that these points um, weren't tampered with in such a way that the, uh, that the attacker um, can, can recover information about the, the long-term static key. So the, in it, to answer your question, uh, whether we can be sure the security is not affected, well, we, we know that in SIDH, the security is definitely affected in the real world with, with, re, with regards to uh, long-term static keys if, if these points are used. Um, and then in a, in a separate line of work, so ignoring the, the uh, static reuse of keys, there was work done by uh, Petit, Christophe Petit, uh, that, that appeared at uh, AsiaCrypt uh, a few years ago, that gave variants of the super singular isogeny problem um, where the uh, inclusion of these auxiliary torsion points leaked information about the secret. Um, and this is kind of irrespective of active adversaries trying to attack a long-term static key. This is looking at the, the difficulty of so solving the underlying a hard problem. Um, Petit showed that if you choose parameters in, a, in an unbalanced way where um, Alice's secret isogeny is, uh, that Alice's secret prime power is a lot larger than Bob's secret prime power, if the, if the parameters are unbalanced in that way, then um, including these torsion points uh, leaks information about, um, or information that can be used to give a, a, a different attack and, and recover the secret. So there's definitely two ways that we know that the security is affected with these auxiliary points. Um, but one of them is, one of them is 
based on parameters that aren't actually used in practice. So um, the, the current belief is that if the parameters are balanced, then these parameters give no, uh, sorry, these auxiliary points give no additional help to the attacker on solving the, um, the, the, the raw isogeny problem um, that they'd be forced to solve without them. And then uh, in psych, the protocol is set up so as to verify that the auxiliary points haven't been tampered with, um, which, which renders those active attacks um, obsolete. I hope that answers, that answers the question. All right, thank you. I think that also answered another question, uh, namely what exact problems led the researchers to create psych after SIDH? Um, exactly what Craig said at the end is uh, one of the reasons that was done. So another question. Um, I think. Sorry, go ahead. And it look it looks it looks like we have time for one more question, Michael. If you if you have one. Okay. There is one. Yeah. Let me find it. There it is. Um, the question is: I'm lost about the quantum properties that you are using in your protocol. I saw just mathematical, algebraic, and geometric properties. Does post quantum refer just about computing? Ah, very good. Uh, that's a great question. So yes, the the idea is um, the idea in post quantum cryptography is that we're doing uh, operations and we're doing cryptography uh, using classical computing. So we're not doing anything differently as far as the the cryptographer is concerned. The the, the the honest parties that are using it to um, obtain security. We're not doing anything differently um, computationally than than we were uh, with with classical means like RSA and ECT. So we're using classical computers to do the cryptography, but the difference is the assumption is that the attacker might have a quantum computer, not that we need to, to use a quantum computer to do the cryptography. So it's stuff. Uh, this is all uh, cryptography that we can we can do on our classical computers today. But the idea is that this cryptography is secure both now against against classical uh, against classical attacks that we that we know we could we could mount today, and it's secure in the case if and when a quantum computer is built. So we're not assuming that either Alice or Bob needs to do uh, quantum operations. They do everything classically just like we do now. We're assuming that perhaps there's an attacker in the middle, either now or in the future that, that has quantum computers. So we're only hoping that the problem is hard. Um, we're, we're, we're hoping that the problem is difficult to solve both classically and quantumly, but through the cryptography from a constructive standpoint, we only need classical operations, the algebraic and geometric uh, operations that you mentioned. And I hope, that, I hope that answers the question. Is there anything else you'd like to add there, Michael? No, I think that was good. Right, then I think we're we're done. There's no more time. Okay. We apologize to everyone who didn't get their question answered. Yes, um, absolutely. Okay, so thank you uh, all very much for attending today. We really appreciate uh, your petition and uh, your participation and your uh, interest in the subject. Um, it, and as I said earlier, if you're interested in learning more, there's a list of um, resources in the resource list to the right of your screen. Um, and yes, thanks very much and have a great day.